beautifully demonstrating at this moment. If you will take out any electronics you have, and if you will shut those off, please. I know mom might write in the middle of this and want to know what you want for dinner. Could be the opportunity of your lifetime to have a hot date set up, but we'll have to wait. I think I've, um, you've met all of me, I haven't met all of you individually, but I'm Barbara Gorski, the director of Business 200. And thank you for being here today. Thank you for registering and all that good stuff. Anyone not sign in at the front, at the tables out front? Okay. Um, so we're very fortunate to have five panelists with us today, and I want to um, particularly thank Emily, who's outside. Emily, we're talking to you. She's waving to us <coughs> for having arranged the panelists. She's one of the Business 200 facilitators. And our objective today is to hear from professionals in the field and have them talk to us about the business aspect of running nonprofits and also the career path into nonprofits. Uh, we'll have time at the end for questions from all of you, but if you could shut your laptops off, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we're ready to start. Let's start just with some introductions. Let's go down the line and, no, let's not go down the line. I'm going to pick one of you next, just to keep you a little on edge. Um, so to tell us who you are, where you work, and the mission of that organization. And let's start with you, right here, yes. Right. Great. Well, my name's Ryan Stoff, and I am the uh, Vice President of Corporate Development at Junior Achievement of the Upper Midwest. Uh, so our mission is to inspire and prepare young people to succeed in the global economy. So we provide K through 12 programs that focus on financial literacy, college and career readiness, and entrepreneurship. Um, by way of open, I do, do just want to mention two quick things. I, I live just down the street from here, so some of you look familiar because you've cut through my backyard. Uh, I'm just, I'm only kidding. Uh, and I, I, this is probably a horrible thing to share, but I, I am a Johnny. <gasps> Um, we don't have to talk about the most recent football game if, yeah, if you don't want to, but um, I, I do want to share that uh, my wife is getting her master's here, mm -hmm. and uh, I have, living here, very much enjoyed the community uh, of St. Thomas, so um, bridges can be built after you graduate. And Ryan, we'll make sure you have a, a couple of bodyguards yes. to get you out of here. And let's go next to you. Hello, my name is Diana Dawson. I'm the Community Relations Manager over at Bridging. Uh, I've been there about nine years now, started as a volunteer, in fact, along my path. And what Bridging is, is we are a nonprofit serving the Twin Cities. We are providing furniture and household items to families who cannot afford to. Um, so taking all those good resources out there, furniture, housewares, passing them on to families in need. About 4,000 homes a year, 12,000 people. It may not sound like a lot until I tell you that's roughly 10 semi-loads in and 10 semi-loads out a week. So we need your stuff, but we need you too. So uh, two locations, and if you've heard about us in another way, it's probably the bed race for bridging out at Buck Hill. If you've been out there, yes, the beds are provided, come in a costume. It's a great time if you're stuck here on first weekend in March. It's probably the most interesting fundraiser, I, I think. Um, so you get a team of four, you get on a mattress that has like a big plastic pillowcase on it, and you race down the mountain at Buck Hill. Um, so it's very cool. I just think it's so, it's so innovative. Many times for organizations, fundraisers, it's just as important that they provide um, information about your organization as the funds that come in. So I think it's a great way. And you pair with, who's your corporate partner in that? Uh, Subway and uh, many <coughs> others. Delta, yeah. give us tickets, prizes, oh yeah. Great. We'll give you prizes, too. Great. And let's go to our other woman on the panel. Hi, my name is Julie Huck. I'm the Volunteer Programs Manager at Project for Pride in Living. And PPL is a housing and social services organization. Um, if you think about Habitat for Humanity, we're kind of the rental 
um, version of, of Habitat. Uh, we build and manage affordable and supportive housing. We also provide employment training, education, and youth programs. So our goal is to help people become more self-sufficient, to connect them to the resources that they need to achieve their goals. Incredibly comprehensive program in the cities. Mm -hmm. um, I, one, one thing to think about with uh, Project for Pride and Living is how they identify what their core competencies are, where, what areas they've moved into, which areas do they choose not to participate with because that's not part of their core competency. So let's go to the far end. Uh, hi, everybody. I am uh, Adam Fitek, and I'm the Volunteer and Donor Relations Director for Accountability Minnesota. Is there any volunteers in here? Any accountability from Minnesota no, folks? No, <laughs> maybe by the end. Uh, I, uh, so Accountability Minnesota, we provide free tax services uh, and also fi free financial services uh, to low-income families and also people who are self-employed. And uh, to balance the panel out, um, I am a Tommy, so ah. <clears throat> just stick with me. <laughs> and our final guest speaker. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Oland. I'm the Education Director at uh, the Youth Express Program, which is part of Keystone Community Services. Uh, Keystone's headquartered here in Miriam Park neighborhood. Uh, we uh, operate youth social enterprises. Uh, if you've heard the word social entrepreneurship or social enterprises, that is kind of a kind of a, a, a branch of the nonprofit sector that's kind of booming right now. But essentially, what we do, our specific version of that, is we operate two retail small, business, small businesses over on Selby Avenue, uh, Express Bike Shop and Express Yourself Clothing. And we use those as, as basically learning labs to have young people uh, get their first job experience, learn how small business operates, uh, and uh, hopefully leave with uh, the ability to compete out in the, uh, the workforce. So. Uh, that that's our that's a youth express program within keystone community services keystone does a lot of other programming uh, we just recently merged with keystone uh, so that's i'm still getting up to speed on all the keystone language but they do basic needs and senior services and kind of that old settlement house tradition which is kind of cradle the grave services for for the community that they're in so good to be with you great partnership in terms of when you think about organizations that merge what does each bring to that new relationship that the other was lacking? And I think that's a brilliant partnership, really. Challenges that there have been in coming together? Talk to us about the merger. Oh, the merger. Uh, <laughs> uh, the merger, you know, I think, I think with the, the most recent kind of economic uh, downturn, uh, recession, whatever you want to referred to it as, I think, I think that was one, a point in time at which um, mergers became more attractive um, to people for different reasons. Uh, for us, we didn't fit the particular profile of others that merged, I guess, but we are both fairly strong organizations. Um, I think we as a, a smaller community-based organization doing kind of a, a somewhat unique kind of programming um, I think we wanted to do more of that, but we didn't have the capacity to do that. And so we either would have had to hire people on to help us do that um, or merge with an organization that had that capacity already. And uh, we had a shared board member, Keystone and, and Youth Express did. And so that's kind of how the ball got rolling. Uh, we started talking about all the, uh, the bigger things we could do together rather than uh, as separate entities. They had a desire to expand what they did with young people. Um, and their spectrum of services, so so it made sense, uh, and it was it was nice to be able to come together, um, two strong organizations come together rather than kind of one who was struggling and one uh, and one that was much stronger and have this weird kind of dynamic. Uh, in that sense, we both had unique things to offer, and, and it, it it made for a great pairing. So, and it's um, we're here. April is when it became formal, so we're um, not too far into it, mm -hmm. but. Your cultures are very different, though. I mean, Youth Express is sort of this, <laughs> as social entrepreneurship tends to be, kind of um, more free thinking, mm -hmm. not as confined, not hierarchical. Mm -hmm. Keystone tends to be, you know, there's very distinct segments to that organization. Mm -hmm. You even look different. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah. Youth Express, some of the folks there I've met, you know, it's more casual dress, mm -hmm. more piercings. <laughs> <laughs> um, Keystone works with a lot of elderly, a lot of people living in poverty. It tends to, I don't want to say it's conservative, but certainly more conservative mm -hmm. than your organism, than yeah. Youth Express was. How's that working? Because that's the issue usually that happens with mergers is sure. whose culture takes over. Right. Well, we're, we're fortunate. Uh, we laugh at Youth Express because we, we joke about acting like a startup since we began. I mean, we, we were always, um, we're smaller community based. We're, we're nimble because we've been nimble because of that. And so we've been able to do, you know, startup enterprises and things like that. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. I think what's been nice working with Keystone is they, the key, to, the key to the whole thing is that Keystone realizes that about us Ooh. and has really, we've, we've been able to set up the structure of the merger so that we're really able to still do all those things that we did and to get where we're at and to do those um, creative things around uh, youth enterprise uh, and have the freedom to, to move independently. So there's, there's legal structural names for all these things um, in the nonprofit world, how you can, there's lots of different structures now in place. It's not just the typical nonprofit 501c3. There's lots of things and options if you want to get more creative um, as organizations. And I think, uh, so Youth Express is a program more or less operates as a, as a wholly governed subsidiary um, of Keystone, so we have a lot of um, independence in how we do the enterprise side of the social enterprise side of things, and that's necessary because we compete in the marketplace like other businesses. So we need to have that ability to uh, adapt and be creative and make quick decisions. So, great. I don't know if that helps, but Ryan, how did you get to your job? What's your degree from here? I mean, I'm sorry. I'm saying Ryan, and I'm looking at Adam. Adam, how did you get here? What was your degree here? That's from a good here? question. Um, so my degree was in math economics. So uh, what I'm doing today uh, in some ways has nothing to do with that. And I think most people don't wake up and go, you know, when they're young and say, I want to be a fundraiser, or I want to be a volunteer manager, things like that. Um, so it, it kind of came a little organically. Um, I graduated. I have uh, worked for a couple of different banks. So I worked for Lehman Brothers, if you guys know them, they're the bank that imploded that started the financial crisis, so you can blame me. Um, <laughs> and I worked for U.S. Bank, so I, I worked more on the corporate side of things, and I was uh, just kind of, I think, felt bored by the work that I was doing and, and um, it not really engaged in it, and um, so I ended up do, going back to school, and I, I did a graduate degree. Um, and I did it in public policy with this focus in um, nonprofit management. And it's kind of after I did that, I en ended up at uh, Accountability Minnesota. Um, but I, I think part of it was just like, frankly, like I'm 30. I spent my 20s basically like figuring out what my skill sets are, where are the places that like would be a good match, and also the organizations that I like really felt like energized and passionate about. And, that's kind of how I ended up here, but I, you know, I bounced around a little bit. Can we talk about energy and passion, whoever wants to speak? Um, if you've been in the for-profit side versus the nonprofit, how are your days different? How, particularly in terms of your eagerness to get up in the morning. And tell the group again your name and yep. your organization. Uh, Diana with Bridging, and I, that's an easy one to answer this time of year especially, because I will tell you it's one, the work I go to every day at Bridging, we, like many organizations, run on volunteers. But every day, I put it this way, in the building I house out of in Bloomington, I walk in and every day there are 40 volunteers that come Monday, 40 Tuesday, 40 Wednesday. So you know when you go to a job on Monday and everyone's like, hey, how was your weekend? And then you're kind of done with that. I do that every day of the week. <laughs> But they're all choosing to be there. It is very different to go to a job where everyone who's there is really choosing to be there, and you're not around cranky coworkers who are like, ah, this stinks, and they're having a rough week. You can have that, but when the bulk of who's in our building outweighs, you know, with the attitude of, I'm here because I want to be, that makes it much easier. And usually this time of year, everyone's like, oh, I bet it's so great to work for a nonprofit when it's Christmas. I'm like, it is your round. I like what I do. It's really easy to do the work. You've got to like it. I couldn't imagine going to a job that would make me miserable. And I can honestly say I have not had one of those jobs in all my life. 
So wow. you got to choose. And if I had one, it was I went great. Three months done with that. <laughs> and Diana, we we could just continue your background, academic background. Uh, yep, um, Marquette. So uh, I went over to Marquette. I got out of the state, but all my siblings have gone here. Um, I uh, had a degree in sociology, uh, family studies, English minor. So yes, everyone went, hmm, what do you do with that? And I went, well, I uh, graduated, did a little bit of travel, and a friend of mine was working at the YMCA, said, hey, we need more summer staff. Come on over. I had literally a phone interview. They said, you need a job. Great, we'll give it to you. <laughs> Stacy says, you're good. And that led me on a path at the YMCA for... Uh, uh, five years at the branch level and then uh, left with my own business. Uh, Child Care Center came back for another five years as a product specialist for the association. So that was really about how to run the school age and child care programs well, like a business, because again, this isn't just about, hey, great, come on over. You got to know what you're doing. Um, and then I've been at Bridging now for nine years. Um, and my path there was first as just coordinating the volunteers for one site. Uh, now I'm really overseeing our community relations, and that's getting the word out, building awareness, running the volunteer programs, and knowing how to convert a donor and a volunteer into a, a partner, a financial donor, a product donor, and really creating a holistic approach to it. Brian, you were going to talk about your, your day. Yeah, well, I was actually going to address the, the whole concept of, of energy, and when I uh, initially started a nonprofit, uh, one of my very first experiences involved someone uh, that I was working with pulling me aside and saying, you're, you're gonna love this work because you get to see largely people at their very best. Uh, and I think if you ask anybody up here on the panel, uh, you know, we rely on volunteers, businesses to, to drive our missions. And in those interactions, people are there to help. I mean, get the general complaint every now and again. But 99.9% .9 of the time, they're there to help and to, to, see, to see that, to see people taking time out of their day, to see people giving because they want to make a difference, uh, that, that creates a, a lot of energy. And, and I, for me personally, uh, it also draws to the impact that you see make in, in the lives of people and, and uh, in my own personal uh, life. Uh, my, my mother had me in her early 20s unexpectedly. Uh, she worked a couple of jobs, um, struggled to make ends meet. Uh, when I was two and a half, I was outgrowing the, the crib I was sleeping in, and we were living in an apartment building just off of Snelling, and um, she knew that she needed to give me a full-size bed, but she didn't have the, the money to do that, and she went down into the laundry room in her apartment building uh, that one night to do some laundry and uh, looked in this little storage room off to the side because the door was open and the light was on and leaning up against the wall was a full-size bed and on the bed there was a note attached and it said to whom it may concern please take this bed there's nothing wrong with it it's next to new I simply don't want the hassle of selling it and then it said pass it on and that was a defining moment in her life and people would stop by and just drop off groceries so that she you know could feed herself and feed me um, and and that stayed with her for her entire life and she passed that along to me and and I think stories like that exist in in every organization and to be connected to that I think is is something special and, and really provides a lot of energy <clears throat> Julie will you tell, talk a little bit about your academic background and how you got to PPL Sure. Well, I went really far away. I'm from here, but I went to school um, for my BA at Wesleyan in Connecticut. Um, got a BA in psychology, knew that I wanted to be in social services and nonprofit. Um, I got a master's from Harvard in human development. And through a practicum there, I discovered a passion in working with teen moms. So finding you know, girls who were maybe 16 who were having babies and it was a crisis point in their life, but it was also really an opportunity for them to start to take school seriously, think about their career path, um, and I just really enjoyed what I did. So I worked with several programs, with teen parent programs, um, moved out to San Francisco, worked for Habitat for Humanity, and worked with families who were maybe older versions of the teen families that I was working with. So families that were going through a lot of struggle, maybe because they were recent immigrants or because of a lack of education or abuse or what have you. 
um, were struggling, but were really doing the best that they could for themselves. And by participating in Habitat, I mean, Habitat has a great reputation in the business community as really providing a hand up and not a handout. So people are really working to earn and buy the homes that they, they inhabit. Uh, so that was a great experience working there. Moved back to Minnesota and you know, having young kids, um, I found that I was starting to worry about the families that I was working with um, and the kind of situations that I would see every day. I knew that I still wanted to be a nonprofit, but to me, the kind of thing that I do now is almost corporate compared to, to what I did before. So um, knowing that PPL was a really great organization, took advantage of an opportunity there, an opening there. And I work a lot with the, with the business community and with community groups. I also work with participants, but I really enjoy um, that opportunity to interact with sectors that I didn't before. And like you said, um, people that want to be there, really want to be there every day. Interesting. Hmm. Next question. Let's shift a little bit more to marketing of your organization. Now, you work with a wide array of clients. How do your clients, your donors, and your volunteers find out about you? Clients, donors, and volunteers. Uh, clients, uh, we have young people Surprisingly young, it's not very hard to find young people who are interested in um, a part-time job. Um, it's, it's, it's challenging, so we don't have to recruit all that heavily. Uh, over the years, I think Youth Express has had a, gained a reputation for working with young people um, in, you know, in local communities in St. Paul, and so there's a lot of word of mouth that's, that's happened as a result, and, so, and they know that we do youth employment. So a lot of, a lot of um, high schoolers will come to us um, through, through from from the schools, Central High School is not far away, um, but other schools around St. Paul. Um, there's other partner organizations um, that we that we've known over the years, YWCA of St. Paul, um, you know Parks and Rec um, in the city of St. Paul, and then the Youth Job Corps in the city of St. Paul has also been kind of a big partner for us in terms of connecting with with young people and getting them plugged into the training and uh, the apprenticeships we do at the two enterprises. So for clients, that's, that's, that's really um, what we do, primarily word of mouth, but also um, those, those other institutions. Um, for donors, uh, we have, you know, up until our merger with Keystone, we, we really focus mostly on, um, with the enterprises, earned income that side of things. Uh, so the bike shop is able to um, support its day-to-day uh, -day operations it's, um, and, and even uh, earn a little bit of money. Um, but above and beyond that, when it comes to the training of the apprentices and the wages for them, we have to go out and, and find additional funding sources. So that's going to the traditional funders, you know, private foundations, community foundations, corporations, um, all those places you write grants to, to, to cover those additional costs of the training and hiring. Um, so uh, we, we do some traditional fundraising. We, with Keystone coming, merging with Keystone's really given us an opportunity to up our game when it comes to individual, individual giving. Um, and they also have kind of a unique program that they started before the merger, which is called Keystone Business Partners. And they've really made an effort to connect with uh, small to medium-sized businesses in the community uh, who want to support um, different programs that they have. And I think what we're looking forward to with, with that particular program is the fact that we run enterprises already and we think there's some, there's, some there's some affinity that those businesses will have for what we do in terms of working with the young people in, in enterprises and teaching them how small business operates. They can appreciate that. So we're really looking forward to connecting with more of those types of donors of small and medium-sized businesses. Um, for volunteers, I think Keystone's also gonna help us with that quite a bit. We have always worked with volunteers on more of a project by project basis. So we, we don't have ongoing uh, volunteer opportunities that, that um, people can plug into. Um, so what we've typically done is if we have, for instance, we're gonna have, be having a, the clothing store that we operate is going to be having a trunk show. 
Uh, we've teamed up with St. Kate's design students and they're gonna be creating designs out of clothes that were already in the store and bringing them in and we're gonna do a trunk show and we'll have some um, local fashion experts come in and do the judging. And, but we've, had to, we've been able to bring in some other volunteers that we've worked with over the years to consult with us on um, whether that's the marketing piece of it or the event coordination of that and working with the young people that work at the stores to pull off the event. So it's, it's kind of finding sometimes uh, volunteers who fit a certain niche and plugging them into what we do. Uh, and we've, we found that works pretty well. We, we probably don't have enough day-to-day -to, -day to keep people, keep volunteers busy um, in a meaningful way. Um, you know, so I think we've opted for more of that project-oriented um, volunteer. So different work design, really, for the volunteers yeah. than some more other organizations would have. Where, where, give us the street address again of your um, clothing store. Oh, sure. We're, on, um, we're between Lexington and Hamlin on Selby, so Pizza Luce is over there. Um, so we're just down the street, right on the corner of Selby and Dunlap. Um, Express Bike Shop and Express Yourself Clothing. And um, yeah, they're, they're right next to each other. So, so stop by. So stop by. We, <laughs> both places will welcome your donations. Uh, any, any bike, any condition, they'll take it. Um, clothing, clothing store is, um, has a bit more of a, they're, they're going for a, a, a specific market, um, target market. So, so I'm, they, they handle donations a little differently, but they usually are very welcoming of them. And if they essentially will pass anything on that they can't use to places like Goodwill or, um, you know, other places that can handle, handle the volume, so. Adam, what about marketing for your clients? I mean, you have non-English speakers you work with uh, in terms of your clients coming. How, does, yeah. how do you do that? How so, does the word get out? Um, I'm just gonna share a short anecdote. Um, I was in New Orleans last week. Has anybody heard of um, Jack in the Box? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the fast food restaurant, you guys have heard of it. Um, what do you guys think when you hear Jack in the Box? Does anything come to mind at all? Do you guys have anything? This might have, yeah, yeah. does anybody remember they had a huge salmonella outbreak in like the <laughs> 90s? Like, so I was, we were, we were driving by and we were like talking about that, right? It's like been over 15 years since that happened and like, I don't know what, what you guys think, but like my first impression was like, oh yeah, they're the place that like killed like 15 people. So I'm not gonna, I'm probably not gonna eat there, even though the Waffle House probably wasn't much better, but. Um, <laughs> My point being is that, like, in business and nonprofits and life, essentially what you have is your reputation as an organization. Um, so while you can spend money to try to change that reputation, um, and a lot, of, a lot of businesses and some nonprofits try to do that, um, it can sometimes be very difficult. And for nonprofits that may not have huge marketing budgets, uh, I know we certainly don't, um, reputation is incredibly important. So you know, for our customers that come, if they get their taxes done, right, and it's done really well in a high quality way, that's really good. They're hopefully gonna tell more people, which is gonna hopefully get more people to come there next year. Vice versa, if they go there and it's just really bad, if it takes a long time, if they're done wrong, uh, they're gonna tell probably a lot more people about their negative experience and that they sh you shouldn't trust somebody who'll do it for free and you should go to HR on Block or whatever. Um, so we depend uh, rather largely on kind of word of mouth. Um, we partner with other nonprofits and help get the word out and things like that, but it comes back to our reputation. So it comes back to the experience that people have, our partners have, our donors have, our volunteers have, and if it's a good one, they'll hopefully kind of pass it on and um, more people hear about that to volunteer, to give, and then to get their services uh, there. Diana, who are your competitors? I, and I know nonprofits don't like to talk about the fact that you have competitors. Oh, I don't mind. But <laughs> where are your goods, your clients, your volunteers, your donors when they're not with you? Yep. Um, clients, I'll start there. All of our clients come by way of referral. So uh, we have 150 registered agencies that refer the client to us. It's about uh, 1,500 caseworkers who actually are doing that home visit determining someone's eligible and what they need. We rely on them for complete 
ownership in that aspect. Um, and that word just keeps going, and we had, those agencies keep signing up because we're the only game in town. So for them, we're the only ones really offering a basic home setup. So we don't have competition in that market. Um, even an anecdote to give yourself a pat on the back, it's we're the largest furniture bank in the country. We provide the most amount of goods to the most amount of people, and I say that for your benefit to know that you live in an incredibly rich community. We get philanthropy, volunteerism, and reuse. And we need all three of those things at Bridging, and that is an amazing thing. Other communities actually call me who do furniture banks and say, how do you get volunteers? I go, they called me. And again, it relies back to a good reputation, a good meaningful opportunity. The donors, I cannot echo what Adam just said anymore. Those, that word of mouth is instrumental. Um, and so for us, when a donor or volunteer, the community knows who we are and what our mission is, they will keep coming back. So we don't think of it as competition with goodwill savers or anything else, because the reality is, once someone understands with us, it's donate in, donate out, for the intended purpose of helping that family, and the, kind of the why and how they get to us, they're immediately converted. Hmm. Great. What do you want? I'll bring the rest of it to Goodwill. Great. You don't want clothes. And we even provide a list of great places to go with other goods that we don't want. Be a good resource to your community, but we're not, we don't think of ourselves as in competition. There is in terms of getting the word out. Spending time on marketing and advertising and spreading the word is important because they do need to know who you are. You can't be the best kept secret. We are tucked away enough that people do not know where we are and we're not in the main drag. They see goodwill and savers. They don't realize for us where we are and what we want. So we do have to figure that out. So we go through rebranding and marketing. We're 26 years old. Uh, and when I started in 2005, there was a small rebrand. 2010, we had another rebrand. And we really locked it in in 2012 when, because of a great volunteer who worked for an ad company who said, you should apply for our pro bono scholarship this year, they not only took us on, but they spent re-logo, tagline, website, full-on rebrand, and it was a pro bono of a million dollar donation. Wow, wow, wow. You had to ask for it. <laughs> so. Interesting, interesting. Um, one of the things that will happen in your third class, your third Business 200 class, is that uh, probably your facilitator is going to be showing a short video where the speaker talks about um, our inappropriate thoughts about nonprofits in terms of that they really shouldn't spend so much marketing, they shouldn't spend so much on overhead because it really should go to serve the client. And really what a disservice that does to the nonprofit because without being able to market, without being able to reach out, they really can't do their jobs effectively. And we have no problem with Dasani spending, you know, a gazillion dollars on, uh, it's Coke, spending a gazillion dollars on marketing. But if a nonprofit, you know, wants to go spend $5,000 on an event, that might bring in a half a million, we say, well, that 5,000 could have really gone directly to your client. So you'll see that video, and I think it will make some interesting points, particularly as you hear these folks talk about uh, marketing. Um, one of uh, my colleagues, could you give me a time check? What time are we at? 12.30. I shut off my phone, so I you know, did what I was asked. 12.35, somewhere in that zone. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the management challenges from your organization. So if today each of you became the executive director of your um, nonprofit, what would be the biggest management challenges facing you? And Julie, will you start for us? And sure, and actually our CEO that we all love, sadly, after 16 years, um, is leaving to head the downtown improvement district in uh -huh. Minneapolis. So someone actually could become the CEO of PPL. It's not going to be me. Um, but I think talking about mergers, we've actually had six mergers or program acquisitions in the last five years. And I think you know, each one that we take on, um, we do better, and it, it gets more seamless. Uh, but there are still some lingering effects, I think, of integrating all of these other organizations into PPL and making sure we're not duplicating efforts, that we're making, uh, we're integrating staff, integrating the cultures together, uh, we're making the community aware of the new organization, you know, not, not losing the character and the high quality of services of, of the 
former organizations. So I think that's, that's still a little bit of a challenge that the next CEO will face. What kind of um, skill set will you be looking for in that new CEO? Is it more important that that person comes in with um, uh, the social science background to understand your client, or will you be looking for somebody to come in with more of a business financial perspective on the organization? What do you think? Um, I think PPL is a pretty unique organization in the type of industries, really, that are part of the organization. So you know, we do real estate development, we do property management, we authorize charter schools, uh, we have early education programs, we have after school, we run employment programs. So it's a pretty complex organization, and uh, the person coming in, I think I would, I would say, I'm not selecting them, but, but business skills would be more appropriate um, rather than a social services background so much, although the person needs to have the understanding of our clients and really the, the heart for the work in the community as well. So a business person with the right heart. Exactly. Great. Let's Ryan, what about you? What would be the biggest challenge if you were now CEO of Junior Chief? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And uh, because I work on the development side and focus on fundraising, I, I probably will take uh, that slant in, in answering. And I think uh, one of the biggest challenges is just um, ensuring and growing support, but maintaining the essence of who you are, uh, and particularly from a, a fundraising standpoint. Um, we're an organization that gets a lot of support from business. We get a lot of corporate grants, sponsorships, uh, and a lot of our event participation comes from, from business. Um, when you look at something like securing corporate grants, and, and if you look at the, the dollars we raise and how we raise it, we don't get a lot of large gifts. We get a little bit from a lot of different sources. And so as organizations look to focus their giving in areas that make sense for their business, that further their own brands, they want to put their, their stamp on the community. Uh, they want to make sure that their, their brand is out there. Uh, and so sometimes that leads to organizations, businesses wanting to do some, some unique things, which is great because you always want to innovate as a no nonprofit. Um, however, if... Um, you are gaining all of that support and you're doing a, a bunch of different unique things for a lot of different organizations, you, you're spreading yourself so thin that you can't really focus on your core and who you are. And so um, I think that's a, a challenge that a lot of uh, nonprofits face. It's been called mission creep, uh, just you know, having, being, being centered on who you are, focusing on innovation, but not so much so that you're you're spread thin and, and lost in the shuffle. All of that core competency stuff that we talk mm -hmm. about in classes of mm -hmm. who, what are you and what what aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I mean it's it's certainly a, a challenge because if if there's you know support that's on the table, it's it's very hard to uh, you know deny that or or not follow through with that and, and secure that, but. Um, you know, I, th I think you always have to be considerate of, of who you are and where you're going. That's why having, having a vision, having a plan um, is, is important. Um, that's, that's not to say that, you know, you should be so rigid as to not entertain those opportunities because, you know, great things can come from that. But it's, it's always having that balance. The interesting thing that happens with grants that could be either from government monies or more often from foundations or corporations is that, that they will put, the, the funding organization, the foundation will put out a, a call for grant proposals and you apply saying, if we have your money, we will do this. Unfortunately, there's few organizations that put out a grant proposal that says, if your junior achievement and you'd like to do economic uh, literacy education for K through 12, please apply. So they might, it might be something that's slightly a good fit, but you might have to morph into something else. And so it gets very tempting to say, we really need this money. It's close. It's 80% mm -hmm. it's right on to what we do. And yes, we'll also do driver education as part of that because that will reduce insurance costs and, 
and all of a sudden you're doing all these other strange things. Yeah. And, and uh, just to kind of piggyback on that, if you know, if if you're in organizations that that is dedicated to integrity, you know, the, these these grants come with strict guidelines, uh, strict reporting, strict metrics. Uh, that you have to follow through and and really deliver on, and so so that's where it gets into that that yeah. stretching, um, you know. But you do you do have to be creative and look for ways that you align with proposals that exist out there. But mm -hmm. you always have to balance that with with who you really are. Right, and sometimes accepting another grant by the time you do what is asked for, um, and then have to add on the measurements and the evaluations, you can almost end up spending more than you had the grant provide you for if you're not real cautious about that. Um, you're in charge. You're taking over bridging, Diana. What's your biggest challenges? <laughs> um, I mean, it one, seems so easy. You just get furniture know, in, right. you get furniture out. I mean, what's the big challenge? Um, you know, one is, and we are currently, we struggle through this. Uh, as you grow and you want to become a really retribble, uh, retribble, retribble, excuse me, organization, Having the right board in place is very critical. And it goes back to having people understand what your mission is and how you're gonna get there with the resources that you have. Because you can have incredible resources in staffing to a point, but there is still limitations and there's only so many hours in the day. Um, you have to be in a management team and as an executive, you have to be strong to be able to tell someone, nope, that's not a good fit. And it, I really go back to that. And it is hard for people to hear that for whether that be the board or your funders to say, we're gonna pass. Thank you so much for the offer, but that's not what's good for us. You gotta kinda know how to, the negotiating, I do more negotiating in my job than people would have any idea. And that's because you can't just jump at every offer that's given to you. Mm -hmm. And you, there's a lot, because the, the perception, the challenge is still, whether it be with your board or some key donors, is they all think nonprofit's super easy and why not? And, Anyone can jump in and do it, right? And they don't realize that if you're a well-run nonprofit, you've got so many great checks and balances in place. You know how to run your budget, your metrics. And in order for you to keep striving and growing, you've got to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But so many times you get someone in the board, and if they don't really understand your business, we had a, an informational session as a board retreat last year, and we were shocked. There were board members who have been on our board for years who sat there and asked some extremely basic questions of management. And we all went, Oh, mm. they really don't quite get what we're doing, so it's a good thing we did this, and we're probably going to do it every year. Because until they know that, they don't know what to measure is important, mm -hmm. you know, and how to get to that next step. So, And the biggest challenge for us when we rely on volunteers the way we do, because it's corporate as well, but our day-to-day -day operations are, just was mentioning, uh, the boomers. Oh, the boomers. Mm -hmm. no, you know, we used to have great volunteers who'd come in every week and just be right there and reliable and fill in any extra spot you had. And our boomers love to travel and take care of grandkids and be <laughs> everywhere else. And I can help you in April, but I'm going to be gone for May and June, and then I'll be back in July. So as we're having to really rethink how we staff our mm. organization, and that's, that's a challenge because it does mean more money. So now we have to think about paid staff versus volunteer staff in a, another new way. So you got to go back to the board, and they're going to say, why can't you just get volunteers like you always have? Great. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff that you guys talk about in class and learn about in terms of SWOT analysis, you know, what are the external um, constraints and, and um, threats that are coming to your organization? The, the changing age of your volunteer is something that as a CEO, as an executive leader, needs to really look at that organization at that level and say, what's happening outside of us that's going to have an impact on us? And that's interesting to hear about the boomers. Yeah, we are. Uh, a different group to work with. Yes, yes. There are eight ways that nonprofits get funds from the audience. You've heard many of these mentioned. What kinds of things have you heard? How do nonprofits get funds? Yes. Donations. So from individuals and corporations. Corporations really donate in three different capacities. They do cash. They do in-kind services, so when a hotel uh, renovates, they might give you all their old beds, and then also volunteers. Wells Fargo is the largest corporate volunteer to junior achievement, um, and certainly helps the reputation, helps the attitudes of the employees, and definitely helps um, a junior achievement. So 
corporate donations, and then also I'll tag in their individual donations. Each of you will have the opportunity at the end of today to write a check to any of these organizations. <laughs> and if not today, it's sometime in the future. So individual donations. What else? I heard another one come up. Other ways. Yes. Grants. And again, most grants are out of some sort of pro uh, foundation, but uh, corporate related. Um, some government grants, and so there's challenges that come with grants, definitely benefits. How else? You heard about something about a mattress race? What is that? Fundraiser. I hear pretty consistently from nonprofits that it's probably the single most important source of fundraising because it comes with the fewest restraints, but it may not be the largest part of, fund, of their <coughs> whole funding. Um, formula, but fundraising is definitely important. What else? How else are your nonprofits funded? From the, from the panel here, Adam, what, where are your other funding? Mm -hmm. um. Do your clients pay? Clients will make donations. Clients will make donations. Do your clients pay? Yes, and it's probably been our biggest source of change over the years. Um, we started doing appointment fees for clients, so earned income we're talking about. Yes. Um, there's a $60 appointment fee for the $1,300 worth of thrift store valued merchandise they get. Agencies typically pay. Uh, but as of a few years ago, we started charging our donors, too, to come pick their stuff up. And okay. everyone didn't like that. Okay. We said, well, I'd rather charge you than our clients. <laughs> exactly. So, But we've found ways. That's us getting smarter. Yeah. Um, we used to have a dresser program as well. That was for free, but it ran us 100000 a year to build 200 dressers a month. Um, we had to shut it down, couldn't afford it. Uh, for the last two years, I've been charging that back. It's a buy and build program. Um, it's our second full year, and we've sold 2,000 dressers. Wow. 38% our corporate purchase, but I'll tell you what, the next closest is faith-based, 20%. Who would have thought churches had money? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but they do. Yeah. So you'll, you'll have um, either your uh, membership fee... So your clients might pay. Um, if you're a member of the YMCA, you're paying a membership fee. But then also you might have a fee for service that's similar to that. But you might also set up um, something that could be a for-profit within your nonprofit. Now, that's not what Youth Express is doing. But some organizations, like St. Thomas, we have summer housing for conferences that's run as a for-profit that provides funds into our nonprofit. Um, other funding sources could be um, some organizations, some of the large organizations will do investments just like individuals and corporations do. Tax dollars are important, state, federal, and local tax dollars, although those come with lots of restrictions and ways you have to do that. So for instance, Mary Jo Copeland at help, um, Sharing Carrie Hands won't take any tax dollars because she doesn't want to have to follow their guidelines about who to serve. And I'm not sure if I'm up to all of them. In kind. Oh, and in-kind donations. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you want, just as if it was my own personal uh, portfolio of, of uh, funds coming in, you want a diversified a portfolio of, invest of different kinds of revenue sources. But with each one, it becomes more complex. What kind of car do you drive? How is this related? Stay with us, you'll see. <laughs> oh, I drive a Honda Accord. And what year is that uh, Honda Accord? Uh, it's uh, 2002. 2002, so 11 years old. Yeah. Color? Black. Wow. This has nothing to do with it, but I was just curious. <laughs> Your car? Uh, I have a 2004 Mitsubishi Endeavor. Just had the brakes done, so I'm, I'm good to go for a while. Good to go. <laughs> Julia, your car? Uh, 2004, also, Honda CRV. Great. Diana? All right, I'll feel. I did. I got the new car a year and a half ago, Mazda CX 5, but I got rid of the 13 year old car, and it was nice to get that new car. <laughs> Adam? I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I drive a uh, 1990 Toyota Celica, <laughs> 243,000 miles. <laughs> Oh, good. You're going to take it to three? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're driving into your corporate job, would you be driving, would you, if you were still at the bank, would you be driving your older car, you think? Uh, yeah. You would be? Yeah. I, yeah. 
I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm stubborn. I have a, uh, an appreciation for old, beat-up cars, I guess. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. You don't think your boss might suggest that maybe you need to be driving something that looks more like your position? Uh, no. No? Um, your boss would know. Just don't I mean, frankly, me. like, <laughs> it, it, me driving a really crappy car probably has... I mean, it depends on the position, right? So, like, frankly, in my job, if I'm doing fundraising, like, you probably, it can have some impact. Um, I have a former coworker who used to uh, real estate, and she used to drive a Porsche, and part of the reason she drove a Porsche is when people saw her, right, it kind of provided an indication that she was really good at selling houses. Um, and I think it can go the same way. I mean, if you're, if you're a um, nonprofit and you're showing up and you're doing a lot of direct service, I don't know if you really want to be driving a really nice car. Um, vice versa, um, if you're having a meeting with a donor or something else, like you probably don't want to take a donor around in your 1990 Toyota Celica. Although they might write you a personal check. Yeah, they might. <laughs> or made out to the nearest car dealer. What about the things you're wearing today? Adam, do you wear a tie into work every day? Uh, I do. You do? Yep. Interesting. Interesting. And you have slacks on, not jeans? Uh, yep. And shoes? What are those shoes? <laughs> do you have what I call adult shoes on? You know, if we had a runway, we could... Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I was thinking on. about... <laughs> come on, Adam. Right up front. Let's, come on. Uh, I'm wearing... Uh, come on. Come yeah, up here. Oh, good. Okay, so tie <laughs> shoes. Now, Diana, you have on a dress today. Is this typical? Um, no, uh, but it's all washable. So if I'm in the warehouse later on with the group, which I am, and get dirty, i got to be able to deal with that. Um, but no, I'm actually harassed when I'm dressed like this at work um, because of the volunteers are used to seeing me in more casual clothes because I'm working in the warehouse. But when I'm out and about and going somewhere else, I'll change the clothes and become a little more professional and look the part for the place I'm going. And but yes, I received quite a bit of harassment this morning. All in good intention, though. So when I, when I open your closet at home, I don't see 15 suits? No. No. OK. Julia, what about you? Do I see 15 suits in your closet? No, this is my St. Thomas outfit. This is your dress up. These are your dress up clothes. Are you wearing hose today? No, I don't no. own any. What, are you wearing slacks? Mm -hmm. You've got a jacket on today is this typical absolutely not I, and I took out my piercing before I came <laughs> no. Um, no I got pretty for all for all of you um, it's uh, no it, it's funny we, we laugh I mean this is like like you I think I would I get harassed a little bit when I come in like this because it's it's not normal we're I mean we're not slobs but we're not um, but we're typically you know a little more dressed down than this. I think uh, we laugh. Our, our founder, executive director, our, our founder and executive director never really changed out of like athletic pants, a hooded sweatshirt, and a baseball cap. That's that's what he wore, <laughs> like every day. So, so he set the he set the bar, and we've we've we followed. But no, we have the luxury of, of of being youth friendly, and we can be a little more casual in that environment. And but I think when when it when it's called for, we. We get dressed up and, and look our, make ourselves presentable. So, Adam. Um, so like, I think it it like just totally depends on the audience and who you're talking to and things like that. So, I mean, frankly, my girlfriend works in a, for a marketing firm and she wears jeans every day unless she's meeting with clients. So, um, she's more casual than the folks in our organization. Now that being said, um, I'll wear a suit if I'm meeting with a donor, mm -hmm. but I came from a donor meeting like two weeks ago and I was going to a retiree lunch. So I show up in a suit and everyone at this retiree lunch um, is kind of like casual. And frankly, I kind of looked like a, a jackass. So <laughs> like, you know, you, you gotta like, you know, there's, there's a downside to being overdressed as, as well as underdressed. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to Go ahead, please. I'd, say, I'd have to say too, with with the young people we work with, I think that's part of the. It's it's actually part of the the training. I think that goes along with, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, at the bike shop, obviously they're hands on and they're getting greasy and dirty and they've got their aprons on and that's, that's part of the, <laughs> that's the context they're in. At the clothing store, I think the young women, and we don't, this isn't like part of orientation where we say, okay, you work at a retail clothing store. Now it almost happens by itself that they're a little more mindful of that. Um, and so uh, I, think, I think it is very contextual and I think it's okay when we work with young people anyway, we really feel like we do a disservice if we don't have that as part of the conversation mm -hmm. about um, maybe what, whether it's what you choose to wear or what, what you say or whatever, to, to be aware of the context, not to compromise who you are and any of those things, but to, to, to be able to make that calculation. Um, so mm -hmm. just a sidebar. You have the most probably corporate-like job of the panel. Yeah. Um, are you dressed more casually today? Uh, yeah, so, somewhat. Uh, no, it, uh, it, and then kind of hearing everybody talk, it, it really kind of depends on audience and roles and responsibilities. And I was actually just promoted into my current position a couple months ago. And so um, I thought, well, you know, I should probably probably take a look at the wardrobe and uh, see if this is kind of appropriate for, for what I'll be doing, which involves a lot of external meetings at businesses, uh, interacting with our board, who are all uh, executives at, at local businesses. And so uh, actually just this week I came home and I had a uh, couple new sweaters, such as the one I am sporting today. Very nice. And, very nice. Uh, and was uh, quickly informed by my wife that I can no longer shop at Old Navy uh, <laughs> because I'm too old. And uh, that's, that's, hard, that's hard to hear. Um, but, you know, she made the point that you have to kind of dress the part. And I think in somewhat similarly to the, to the Porsches, the, you know, you, you have to kind of dress the part. And you don't want to, you know, you, you want to be effective in what you do. And so you have to understand the audience that you're working with. And, and you don't want to, the barrier to be, uh, you know, wearing ratty, ready sweaters and having that be the barrier to that don't potential donor or supporter that you're working with who you know has to try and get beyond that to to get to the to the real substance of, of why you're meeting with them so so you got to take all of that into consideration and in, in what you do if you were doing work in corporate america would your um uniforms your clothing be different Adam, would, you talked a little bit about this. It really depends on the corporation. But you might be dressing similarly. Do you think you'd be dressing more business attire? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the, um, I think it depends on the culture of the organization. Yeah. Like, uh, I, so I had, this, uh, I had this internship in college at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, right? Like, you're, you're renting cars and stuff, but, like, they were really adamant. Like, you had to wear, have a suit jacket there every day, and, like, you had to wear a white, shirt and tie Monday through Thursday and then Friday on casual Friday you could wear a blue shirt with a tie um, you know and like I don't know like, oh, wow. it, which is just kind of ridiculous to me but like I think that's like the culture that they said um, when I was at US Bank we had uh, some folks who like all their work I mean a lot of our work was internal so they would wear you know like khakis and like a button down shirt no tie and you know, the managers would wear a suit, you know, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it all kind of, uh, it, it depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's regional, ah. too. So I lived in California, and I worked at Habitat in Menlo Park, where Facebook is, and you wore the, you know, backward baseball cap or whatever, and our CEO didn't wear shoes that often, so <laughs> it all depends. It depends. Would your clothing costs in general, do you think, be higher if you were in a corporate setting? Diana? Um, I think mine would. I'm able to get away with more jeans than most folks I know. Um, yeah, I think they definitely would be, you know? And we've got some of our own gear because you want to look the part. We go to fairs because, you know, our image is we want to be down and dirty and keep active and keep busy. So I got to look the part. Even this afternoon with the group, I'll be quick to say, no, no, I'll keep, I'll get in there with you. But yes, I don't look like this every day because I, they need to know that I'm there alongside them. And capable so, yeah. of, of yeah. doing that. What about your salaries? Don't need to give us numbers, but... Can you make as much as if you had gone the non uh, the for profit route? 
Julie, you have a Harvard degree, a Harvard degree. Perhaps you, even with that degree, you couldn't find another job, and so you ended up in a nonprofit. But are your salaries different if you were doing something in a corporate setting? I'm sure, probably, but I've always worked for strong organizations with good reputations, with good fundraising base, so that's something that I do look at, that if I have a nonprofit position, that it's going to be one that's relatively well paid. So you don't have to be poor if you choose to work in nonprofits. No. No. Ryan, what about you? You could take your degree, your focus, and go do other things. Uh, well, I actually think in, in my case, I, I, from a salary and position perspective, I'm probably farther along than I would have been if I had gone uh, state. I, I worked in uh, a corporate environment for a brief time, and um, I think I'm probably farther along because I went the nonprofit route, um, because merely because it's, it's where my skills and, and passion meet, and I, I think that's kind of a key those are key ingredients is that if, if those two things are in play, um, that, that you, you know, you can, you can succeed in, in the, the nonprofit space. You can, can su succeed in any space, but in my case, I think it, it was, uh, that was a driver to, to the, the success that I've seen in, in what I do. Are we over one, past one o'clock? Oh, thank you, can thank I, you. Can I have one thing? Yes, like, please do. Like most things in life and professionally, there's a science to this. Like, so I will say, like, regardless of what any of us are making, like, you need to advocate for yourself. And if you advocate for yourself, you're going to make more money. Um, I think that's universally true, no matter what industry you're in. And there's ways to do that. So if you've ever listened to a podcast on negotiation, I would encourage you to do it before you start applying for your first jobs, because that's going to help you. And as you uh, use those skills, it can help you increase your income. And the reason I'm asking this particular set of questions is also in class three, we will talk about the costs of working in nonprofits versus the cost of for profits. And I think Adam made the point beautifully that you could be in a corporate setting that's very casual in culture, and you could be in a nonprofit setting that's very um, rigid in culture, and those costs would be. Uh, could be exchanged, but there are some general notions about them. So this information will be helpful in our third class. Last comments from the speakers? Any words of wisdom you want to give business students as they're thinking about careers and that sort of thing? Do what you like and what you're good at, um, and don't ignore your gut. I mean, I think you can have a a great job that pays well in a for-profit industry if that's what you like doing. Vice versa, you can have a great job in a nonprofit industry if you like it, because generally if you like it, you're better at it, so. Go ahead. I, I would just, uh, well, I would echo uh, Em's comments about being, you are your, your best advocate. So as you move through your work life, uh, know that no one's gonna be able to promote you and, and your skills and what you do better than you. So um, always you know, remember that as, as you move forward. And, and then I would just say, that start exploring now. I mean, I did not. I waited till after graduation because I was just in enjoying the college experience and then I, I had to put up fences for three months while I looked for a job. But you can do all, all kinds of stuff. You can volunteer uh, and particularly in nonprofit settings, you can you can, there's a lot more latitude to the volunteer in, internships where you can see the inner workings of, of an organization and, and parlay that experience into what you might want to do, whether it's nonprofit or not, down the road. So. I would suggest if you have work study to consider an off-campus position with a nonprofit organization. P PPL hires 40 to 50 work study students a year. And in the last couple of years, we've hired four students in permanent career positions, including our facilities manager, who was an econ major, uh, just kind of took the, the job just, you know, because he needed a job and really develop, developed his skills and learned of his passion for affordable housing that way. 
Every university is required to spend a certain percentage of their federal work study dollars on off-campus roles, so that's certainly something to think about. Only thing I'll add is I love that idea actually, getting off campus, that's huge. Um, but I think the other, the only other thing I would say is spend some time thinking about what you value in terms of, um, not, just, not, not just in terms of a salary or in terms of uh, a particular uh, career path, but I think what that workplace, you want that to look like. Um, because I've found over the time that I can't put a, a particular number on how much I value the people I work with and how they challenge me and the lack of ego in the office and it's 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 refreshing and that's why I haven't moved from where I'm at for since I left um, since I left college so um, it's something to consider Diane? and I would just add in because I love all this and one would be yes don't forget when you volunteer that we are always willing when you commit for longer than a day or two here and there we help you get jobs we write those letters. I have heard from many college students who said, thanks to you, you gave me a reference. Because the references I can give are very different than an employer can give. Um, and so don't forget to utilize that. So get your feet wet, experience, and don't underestimate. You know, when I said I haven't had a job I hated, there were jobs that, yes, you went, eh, but those actually got me to understand what I like and what I don't. Working retail maybe get to understand that I liked working with people. I don't mind that. And, and sales, and that's really what I'm doing every day. <laughs> so... Try those things, take those part-time jobs, because you're going to get stuff out of that, too. If you wait too long, yeah, you're going to be floundering in your 20s not knowing what you like. So just keep going at it. Great. Good advice. Please join me in thanking our speakers. Go to class. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Great. And I'd like